Black Americans were enslaved. Boom! You got us! So yeah, that's just to tickle me with that response. That's exactly what they do. Y'all were slaves. You still been colonized today. So. Black man tells Venezuelan to learn English in the rudest way ever. He is all over the news. Black man in St. Louis, innocent. Still about to be unalived for being innocent. Nowhere to be found. Black man to tell Venezuelan to learn English. Business shut down already. Every news outlet. Everybody's calling for the closing of his business. Business is gone. Y'all wanted to go with the tiki torches and go in front of the... But the black man in St. Louis who about to lose his life, y'all are not speaking on that. Everybody got a video about the black coffee man. Shut it down. That's what y'all saying. But what about the black man that's about to lose his life, though? There are men that are losing their lives and they are innocent. Marcellus Williams has five days, seven hours, 51 minutes, and 19, 18, 17, 16 seconds left until his execution. He is going to be executed on a crime that he did not commit. <laughs> Prosecutors allege Williams burglarized Gail's residence and stabbed her to death before leaving the home with a jacket used to hide his blood-stained shirt, as well as her purse and her husband's laptop. According Williams' attorney has argued that both the girlfriend and Cole, which was the cellmate that said that um, Williams confessed to him, they were both convicted felon and they wanted the $10,000 reward for their testimonies. They also argued that the jury responsible for convicting Williams, who, it, who is black, was stacked against him as it included only one black juror. So review of the evidence used in Williams criminal trial led former St. Louis County prosecuting attorney to seek a new hearing to consider vacating the said forensic testing on the on the weapon indicated that someone else's DNA was on the butcher knife used to unalive Gail Bell brought a challenge before the judge under a 2021 Missouri law that allows prosecutors to review a conviction they believe is unjust. However, Missouri decided that no, we're not, we, we're not going to accept that. We're However, Missouri has decided that even though there is DNA evidence proving that this man did not commit the crime, that they their hands are tied and that they cannot save this man's life and keep him from being executed. Well, um, it's just become like an everyday thing that um, black men get unalived even when they're innocent in situations. And I know race makes some people feel uncomfortable, but this is why we can never ever stop talking about race because at the end of the day, there are men that are losing their lives and they are innocent. And you guys don't care. And it doesn't bother you because the person that is being unalive does not look like your son. But me, I can make a black son. So this bothers me so much. Not only can I make a black son, I am a mother to a black son. And that could easily be my baby. And I will hope that if evidence is proven that my baby is innocent, that somebody will do what's right and save my baby's life so i don't know who this video is going to reach but i just pray to god that it reaches the right people and that y'all do what is right because this man does not deserve to die be one family so i've been informed that the governor's phone line his voicemail rather has is full i don't know any of the alternate numbers if you do know put in the comments below let's blow this up let's help our brother as much as possible remember this is a lynching they a lynching is an innocent man being killed. They know this, and this is what they're counting on. This is what they I think it's retaliatory, honestly, because we've been standing on business, we've been staying on code, and they're they're trying to mentally say, "Hey, y'all get back in line, or else." And we're not we're not gonna waver one way or the other. We're gonna stand on FBA business. We're going to get reparations. We're going to get what's owed to us. We're going to get justice. We're going to get put on equal ground because that's what we deserve. Be one. In America, you need to learn it. Learn English. Learn it. You get money in America. This isn't you getting money in America. Learn English. I don't give a fuck. Learn it. 
Learn it. You riding on the roads, learn English. Learn English. Learn English. Learn English. This ain't your fucking country. This ain't your fucking country. Learn English. Learn English. This ain't your fucking country. Fuck wrong with you, boy. You better learn English. Go get up, 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 if you notice, signs get changed to Spanish and all this stuff, all these accommodations for other groups who just got here and don't pay taxes like that and have done nothing really, made no major impact on the country other than eating up resources from us. Also, you know, they, they shut their brother's shop down. So we need to, his next, in, um, his next endeavor, we need to get behind him, rally behind him, and help him get back on good footing because he wasn't wrong. Well, 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 would you looky here? The man that was talking trash about black women, black Americans, gets humbled on Elon's app. Now, apparently he was on a Hydra only chat. This is how I know this man is sick. He decided to reason with white T supremacists. And I got surprised when I started calling him out of his name and teamed up on him. This right here is just invigorating. It's humbling. I love it. Some people just have to learn the hard ways. Myron Gaines thinking that he could be like his white counterparts. It's hilarious. I don't know if you guys remember this. The thing is, it's not necessarily it's the skin color that's the problem. It's the behaviors that turn me off a lot of the times. It doesn't have to do because I've been with black girls before. Like this was the same guy that was saying he's not down with the brown. He doesn't like black women. Black women are loud. Black women are obnoxious. Here's what his proud boy friends had to say about him when he tried to join the live. Hey, you like, fucking sand digger. You sand Wow. I'm here. I feel like this is a rude awakening for a lot of my black brothers and sisters that are Ethiopian or Sudanese or from any other African nation of origin. I really hope you understand that when you come to this country, you are black before anything else. As a black man, as a man, how could you let someone talk to you like that? And you still want to be in a space that you're not invited to. It just screams that you're not a man with confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Julia Roberts' character and Denzel's character actually become lovers. Denzel changed the story so that they don't have any kind of physical or intimate relationship. And then at the end of the film, there's this moment where they embrace and you think that they're going to kiss. Denzel chose not to kiss Julia Roberts. He, he felt that if he kissed a white woman on screen, it would kind of alienate his audience at the moment, which was made up of mostly black women. So he changed it and they ended up just hugging in the end. Now, that's what we're talking about. Conscious boy. Denzel has always been a rider. That's why we've always rocked with him. Shout out to our brother Denzel. Uh. 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 For reference, this is a South African. Many South Africans have been doing the past few days spewing this weird, hateful rhetoric towards Black Americans. I find it quite ironic that they're saying anything about Black Americans. Because let's sit down for this. You're getting fucking cucked in your own country. People make up 7% of your country, yet they're dominating everything. But I'm wrong when I say at least Black Americans, most of them, can turn a switch on and off, on and off. Cause, oh, doesn't your government own power grid? Oh, you niggas don't have power for 12 to 18 motherfucking hours of the fucking day. Be so fucking for real. Nelson Mandela is rolling in his grave, regretting that he ever saved you niggas. You know what? I'm sure he regrets it. If he was alive today, he would regret you. Oh, and not to mention, your women live in fucking fear every day. Not that American women don't, but I would not be walking in the streets of South Africa worrying about getting my fucking ass grabbed or having my ass snatched by you niggas. But I'm wrong when I say all that. 
I've been trying to keep quiet, laying blow over. Perhaps there's a few bad apples in South Africa or, or Tyler's fans. Day after day, non-stop after non-fucking stop. You guys are conquered bucks in a black country that you guys make up the majority of. Either repatriate your country or shut the fuck up and worry about what time your lights are going to be on again. This is my opinion as a Nigerian who was born and raised in Louisiana. Yeah, rust in Louisiana to be exact. You cannot come from the outside into America and then tell Americans how they need to receive you. Daniel Caesar, James and Fuhad, Tyla. You cannot come into America, want American exposure, American dollars, American, um, what's the word? American support, American fans. You cannot enjoy the benefits of having a core American audience without understanding the American people. I was trying to really decide what the difference is between like Tyla, James and Fuhad, and um, some of these other, are, like uh, Daniel Caesar, some of these artists who have come to the US and why we kind of, why it's been easier to cancel some of them and versus like a Chris Brown um, who have also had a long history of mistreatment of like dark skinned women and black women as a whole. And I was like, oh, it's because they're coming from the outside into America. See, as a Nigerian who was born and raised in Louisiana, I did deal with a lot of sort of the otherism that happens as a diasporaed individual. I was called the African booty scratcher, blah, 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 blah. You know, I've had the same story that any immigrant child um, would have. Here's the difference. Me personally, I understand why that was the reaction. I understand why me coming in as something that is completely different from anything that's happening in this 20,000 person town would elicit some reaction that's like, whoa, 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 wait, what's going on here? African Americans here in the US rightfully are protective of their culture. They're rightfully protective of who participates, who gets to claim it, who gets to see it. And, and I get that. So when they were weird about me coming into the scene, they're like, where are you coming from? What's your thing? What's your thing? What I did was not lash out because they questioned where I came from. I just showed them who I was. And I never had a problem, not since then. They asked me and I let them ask. And I said, I understand why you feel the way you feel. I get it. I'm not what you think I am. I'm just me. I'm just trying to go to class and do my thing. That's it. And I don't have any ill will towards you all. I don't want anything from you. I just want to go to school and have friends. And after that, honestly, I never had a problem again. I never had. And I'm still African, still in Louisiana, but I never had a problem because I came into American culture and I took a step back and said, I'm not from here. Let me understand their perspective because I'm going to live amongst it. I'll never understand the audacity and gall that it requ is required for you to come from outside into an environment and then because you see the opportunities that environment can give you and then tell the environment you're going into how you want them to receive you. You don't know those people. You don't know them. You don't know them. You don't know them. You're you're not them. And you didn't take the time to get to know them. You didn't take the time to get to understand their culture, why things are the way they are. You just want the money. And that's what that's what happens. You wanted the money. You didn't want to take the long way to understand why you're getting the money. And now you're not going to get the money anymore. So sorry. Hate to break it to you. This concept of people who are Africans or outsiders coming into the U.S. with this high, highfalutin, just this high degree of just uppityness is confusing to me because I'm like, surely you're not talking shit when your country, Nigeria, is looking the way it looks. We're talking down on African Americans? Do we? Did we? Everyone, date December, date December. Go to your village. Eh? Is that a road?
There's not mine. There's no road of mine. So I'm not going to open my mouth to talk about how African Americans look because there's no road in my village. So I don't know what exactly the uppityness I'm trying to bring to the table. I'm confused. South Africa. What's going on over there, huh? Are y'all still killing Nigerians? Are y'all still killing us because you don't want us because we took your jobs? Is that what's happening? What's going on? Like, I because since since y'all are so uppity, since y'all have everything together, what happened to that? Like, y'all want to come to America, get American dollars, get American exposure, get 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 the platform that that having American buy-in gives you, but you don't want to understand the American people, the black. American people, the black American experience, the black Americans. And it's not right. And again, I'm saying this as an African whose both my parents were born in Nigeria. My mom was fresh to America when she had my brothers and, and me. And now living in the US my entire life, over 30 years, I'm not, I, I just don't get where Africans get off coming to America and then having an attitude about the Americans. Aside from the fact that the whole reason why you as an African can come to America and have an opportunity is because African Americans did the damn thing and fought for the opportunities that allowed us from Africa to come here and be able to get a better opportunity. That's because of the black Americans here. Aside from that, it is crazy to go to somebody's house, to go inside someone's house and then tell someone inside their own house how they're supposed to react to what you brought into their house. You're inside their house. If you don't want what they want, come out the house. Stay in your own house. But don't come here and then be mad that the people here want something different. That That's just coming from me. I just suggest that if you are an artist, a person who is, who looks like us, who's trying to benefit from looking like us, but trying to keep yourself above the fray, I would, I would highly encourage you to stay out. You ain't gonna come here. You ain't gotta come here. You can stay in London. You can stay in Canada. You can stay in Africa, honey. Stay there. Stay where they appreciate your uppity highfalutin opinion. Stay where you are loved and where you are, where you are so cherished. Stay there and stop coming here and then being mad at us for having an opinion on what you brought to the table. Stop being mad at us for, for calling you out on your bad behavior. Stop being mad at us for saying, look, y'all don't really have a leg to stand on when calling us ghetto. Because what's ghetto is apartheid. <laughs> tribalism, sweetie. Why are we diaspora, honey? Because they use tribalism against us. Come on, come on. Like, let's, let's just start putting two and two together before we start demanding the black American dollar. Okay? And again, I'm saying this as a person whose identity, I'm Nigerian, ethnically. But nationality, I'm American. And because of where I grew up and how I grew up, I identify so closely to the black American experience. I don't I don't try to separate thought. My thing is reparations, if there are reparations ever happen in the US, Nigerian Americans should not receive it. We should go to Britain and get our reparations from those people because they colonized us. So I'm gonna go, the minute reparations become a thing, I'm going to Britain to go and get my money from them because me as a Nigerian, I should not get from the American government. The Americans need to pay the black Americans, the African Americans who built this country and built the opportunities that allow me, a Nigerian, to come here and have jobs doing things. They need to get their money. They're just, just, just dues, okay? So yes, just as an FYI, if you're coming to America to come get American dollars, understand the black American, African American experience first, or stay home, okay? Shout out to these two sisters. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about, rider energy. Now, the first one, she was talking about the continent. I think she's from the islands, just judging by her phenotype. The second sister, she let you know she's from Nigeria, grew up in Boston. That's how you're supposed to conduct yourself. You are a guest, right? You afforded opportunity by the blood, sweat, and tears of our ancestors. 
of them getting their ass whooped and them fighting back and them getting lynched and attacked by dogs and then having to go and take lives. Yes, take lives just to get treated as a human being, just to be able to walk down the street without worrying about somebody just feeling, get a wild hair up their ass and saying, you know what? I feel like wrapping a rope around your neck today. That's how you're supposed to act. Shout out to these two sisters. Shout out for them to checking that energy of uh, from diaspora and checking the uh, and what well, they want to she do. I think she's from the islands. She should have checked her people. However, that's a different topic for a different day. On my last post, I told everyone to go to Twitter and look up Pizza Gate. Well, I did just that, and I clicked on a link and I learned some things. Let me show y'all what I learned. When I tell y'all, my body was so weak scrolling through this shit. I'm typing in these keywords that I, I talked about in my last video. You remember I said they have keywords that they use. Um, I searched those keywords and this is what came up. On Etsy.com, I searched the word pizza and this is what showed up a painting of five little girls that are sad and it's $17,750. I searched the word hot dog and this is what came up on Etsy. $21,450,000 for this painting of brothers and sisters playing on set. Playing on set. It's giving Wayfair 2.0. I searched the word hot dog. This is what shows up. It says still life number one, $3,000. That is $3,000. $23,000. Is it really fake? This part confused me because when you swipe, it was like pictures of a painting or something. I think it was like pizza or something. Ew, I forgot what it was, but $7,500. And this caption it always named happiness a child's delight these what the suggestions look like hold on let me pull up something else yummy yum pizza at the top yummy yum pizza right there mind you i said justin bieber named his song yummy yum and what the video was about look girls assorted pizza listen if you don't get what i'm talking about just go to my last post and just look on twitter to get more context and you might see pictures and they might be too graphic, too scary. You might have damn nightmares looking at that shit. That's only if you dig that deep. This is for TikTok purposes only. Everything that I say in this video is alleged and hypothetical and rumors and gossip. By the way, I tried to make a video about this, but it got flagged. Interesting. Come on now, TikTok. Don't, don't be playing with me. Like, at least make me, let me make another little 2K or something. Like, yeah, like. You got to crack the codes. You see this? account warning i'm talking too goddamn much i need to chill <laughs> black people this is what happens when you don't know how to gatekeep your culture and be exclusive as to things that are culturally important to you no other group has a problem with being exclusive black people only know how to be inclusive and include everybody in your shit which is why it is often appropriated <laughs> Get my top five a nice booties. I wanna set the move on wide or in the grooves. Rock topless when we cruise under the moon. Touch me, baby, whenever you're in the mood. I ain't never ever met no one like you. Can I get you top and still work you to this tune? Backstrokes that a fix your attitude. Lady, baby, the money calls, I gotta move. She said my problems every time I call you working. You barely text back up on your socials lurking. Come beat it up. Guess I need to put in the White people didn't have a problem telling Beyonce where she belonged. And they still don't have a problem telling her right now to this day. But what I find interesting is when Dr. Umar said that Eminem can be great, but you cannot make him the greatest, black people came to defend that white man like white Jesus. White people don't have a problem. Indian people don't have a problem. Chinese people don't have a problem telling people where they belong or when they feel like their culture is being appropriated. But black people, stepping is culturally significant to the black frats and sororities. Let's be real. I didn't say black people started the frats. I said stepping is something culturally significant to the black frats and sororities. <laughs> but y'all don't know how to be exclusive. It's okay to be exclusive. That doesn't make you a bad person. That doesn't make you a racist to wanna be exclusive and hold 
to your heart, to your culture, to your chest, things that you have created. Why does no other culture have a problem telling black people where they belong, but black people have such a hard time being exclusive in things that are culturally important to them? So Michael Eric Dyson gets caught licking the frosting. So on the right here is Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace. Picture here in this photo with uh, Michael Eric Dyson. So he sends her the photo and says, shh, don't tell anybody. We look good together. She laughs and says, ha, 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 ha. Well, your gorgeousness makes the photo. So there's that, he says. Now keep in mind, this occurred after they appeared together on CNN and they had this big exchange over the correct pronunciation of Kamala Harris's name. Remember the Kamala versus Kamala debate? But, but, but when you disrespect Kamala Harris by saying you will call her whatever you want, I know you don't intend it to be that way. That's the history and legacy of white disregard for the humanity of black people. Oh, so now you're calling me racist. I didn't say, that, I just said you weren't racist. Yes, that is completely no, You don't yes. have to intend racism no, to No, no, no. You are it. intending that Your I Your disrespect of Kamala and Harris that is, is part and parcel of a tradition of disrespect. So the congresswoman in a congressional hearing enters the text exchange into the record. Also enter into the record a screenshot of a text message I received from the uh, esteemed professor from Vanderbilt, Michael Eric Dyson, after my CNN interview, begged me for photos. In this text, he says, after calling me a uh, racist on CNN, shh, don't tell anybody, we look good together, and sent me a kissy emoji. Without then objection. The guy, the guy says, I'm gorgeous, and all these photos. I don't think he's that bent out of shape on how anyone pronounces Kamala. I'm sure most of you guys probably know Michael Eric Dyson, but for those who don't, he's an esteemed scholar and professor and also a political commentator. I'm saying all that to say this guy is pretty smart. But this text exchange to me was pretty dumb. So I want to make a couple points that might give Michael Eric Dyson some aid and assist in the future. First of all, in any circle, men, women, no matter the race, what you said to her could be considered flirting. In this climate, you should know better. Secondly, this is an election year. She's a Republican congresswoman. You're a liberal Democrat. That's your political rival. In an election year, anything goes. You can't be cozying up to your ops. Thirdly, the fake outrage. I believe 99% of Americans before that exchange thought Mrs. Harris's name was Kamala, not Kamala. Also, if you thought that she was a racist, why would you be cozying up, sending text messages, and begging to take pictures with her? Occurrences like this is the exact reason why I don't trust these fake news media outlets and a fake outrage. This comment would make sense if these people, teams and promotions and marketing was not specifically geared towards black American people. Or just black people from all over the diaspora who happen to live in this country. Their marketing is specifically tailored towards those groups of people first. That's how they get the amplification to be able to cross over in the first place. You're not doing these podcast shows in sundown towns in the middle of East Jesus Nowhere in Red Counties. No, you're going to Democratic, you feel me, mostly black metropolitan areas to sell out those shows because that's what your metrics is telling you who is watching your shit. These artists come over here and they pair up and go on tour with already established black American artists. They come over here, they go on a breakfast club, they do the BET Awards before they even get the opportunity to step foot on the MTV Awards. Let's talk about it, though. If that's the case, then skip over the Black American circuit and go straight to the audience of people that you want to, you feel me? Get it out the mud. You feel me? Don't use it as a boost if you want to turn around and disrespect it. That's the point. This comment would eat if they was not specifically marketed. Same thing with actors and actresses. It's, they not coming over here telling British stories. They not coming over here telling... No, they in movies about black American people. They playing black American greats and the whole nine yards on Broadway and the shit. Like, if, if, if it was that easy, they would never have to go through the circuit to go through us to get to the main popular culture skip over us they did right by going on the andrew schultz podcast where they fucked up is is that they did not build enough of that population as their fan base to be able to do wrong by the fan base that they already had 
if you want to, you know, forsake your, your black American fan base, when you finally get on and go, go sit on them platforms and do us in, fine. We've seen it a thousand times before, but you do this shit too early and we're going to squash your pockets. Play the shit right. Like, we've seen so many artists cross over, come over here, all respect, all love. We spin their shit we love. And that's the thing. It's no harm, no foul. Come over here, get your shit off. We love all the rich, diverse cultures. I love, you feel me, listening to all the different, to eating all the different foods. All the, Come get your shit off, but you don't have to disrespect it on the way. Like, it, it's just unnecessary. So let's have a conversation about this whole Creole, who's Creole, black, white, all that does, you know I mean? Let's have a conversation about it, again. Now, I'm not gonna lie, as a Creole person, a lot of the people making these videos are misleading y'all and misinforming y'all, and it's actually pissing me off. So let's start off with the things that were said correctly, albeit very few of them. The first of which is that there are white Creoles. You can be Creole and be white because Creole is not a racial identifier. We're gonna come back to race and all this stuff later because race ethnicity and nationality is once again whooping y'all's ass so the first thing that is true you can be black or white and be a creole that is a fact the second thing that is true is the definition that has been given for creole and that is somebody being born of the colony which just means that hey your family was born in louisiana during the time that either the french or the spanish ruled that much is also true here's where shit went left when people start saying, oh, I'm not black because I'm Creole, or oh, I'm not white because I'm Creole, that is false. And what we will not try and do is say, oh, well, race didn't exist as a concept, so I don't identify as black. That, that, is, that is categorically and historically false. Like, the Portuguese set up race as a concept during the 1500s. Colonial Louisiana was not a thing until the 1600s. New Orleans didn't get set up or settled, excuse me, until the 1700s. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, race had very much been a concept before and during these times. We know this because the French also used terms, terms, excuse me, such as passe blanc, which means white passing, or jean de color libre, which means free people of color. So they very much had a, a notion or a concept of race and color during their rule of Louisiana. And if they didn't, then why did they set up different uh, structures and systems for people that fell in different racial categories? Why were there different uh, laws and structures set up for people that were black and white if there was no such thing as black or white? Come on now. So, Creole is not a race. That ass is black or white. Let's, let's start there. Let's move towards ethnicity. Creole could be argued as an ethnic group because it is an amalgamation of a bunch of shared culture, norms, societal makeup, so on and so forth. So you could argue that it is very much an ethnic group. However, it does have a lesser leg to stand on due to the fact that unless your people were legitimately here before Louisiana came underneath American rule, and you are black, you are 100% African American. Our ancestors came from the continent of Africa and we are American citizens. Bottom line, not only that, even if your people were here before that time, we came under a different national rule. We are not under French rule anymore. And your people did not hail from France. We are in America. We are American citizens, and our people have been here for hundreds of years at this stage. So, even as an ethnic group, it kind of has a lesser leg to stand on. And also, I know a lot of times in Louisiana, we try and, like, separate our culture from a lot of other things in different areas. I would argue that some of our cultural practices align a lot more with other African-American groups than they do Creole necessarily because a lot of the Creole history has been lost actually I'm sorry it's been washed away I, 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 I misspoke it's been washed away so like we can't negate the things that we share as, as a group of African Americans we cannot negate that 
And then nationality, Creole does not have a leg to stand on because there's no fucking country of Creole. When you find one, let me know. I, I would love to know where that's at. Print that on a map for me. I would love to see it. So I say all that to see. <laughs> you can be black or white and still be Creole. But even with you being Creole, that ass is still black or white. You do not lose your racial makeup because of something uh, that we identify as as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a community or because of a shared history. Let's not forget that. So again, when it comes to that black lady who's saying that she ain't black and that white lady who's saying that she ain't white, be for real. In Louisiana, that ass is white. And definitely outside of Louisiana, where them people have no context, for the most part, about, again, that shared history and shared culture, you was definitely white. Not only that, should you have been alive during colonial Louisiana, you would have benefited from being white and being a white woman. Let's be clear. Just like you benefit from it not. So don't try and don't. I just got pissed off again. So Trump, J.D. Vance, and the Republican Party has taken one story out of Springfield, Ohio about Haitians eating pets. A story that's not true, by the way. The lady who originally spread this rumor has come out and said that she regrets spreading this false information now that Haitian kids are being threatened with bombs in their schools. Nonetheless, Trump and J.D. Vance continue to run with this narrative so that they can demonize an entire group of immigrants, so that they can demonize an entire group of Haitian people because they don't want Haitian immigrants in their town of Springfield, Ohio. And they want to be able to run on the narrative that all immigrants are bad and dangerous and should be expelled from the country and that they're poisoning the blood of this country, right? Well, I also found one story out of Racine, Wisconsin, about a sheriff having intercourse with a dog and sharing child corn with their colleagues. So by Republican logic, that would mean all sheriffs are having intercourse with dogs and all sheriffs are sharing child corn with their colleagues. Do you see how absurd that is? But this is what we're doing in 2024 with our politics, right? This is what we're doing using stories to demonize entire groups of people. And that's how racism works because you mean to tell me that all of America is making jokes and memes about black Haitians eating cats and dogs, a debunked story. Meanwhile, it's crickets around a true story about a white sheriff getting down with a dog bestiality name one time trump was racist okay i will 1973 the nixon administration sued trump for refusing to rent to black people 1980s trump's casinos were accused of hiding the black staff when trump visited 1989 trump took out a full page ad arguing for the death penalty for a group of five black men that was central park five effectively putting a bounty on their heads and plaguing them with a lifetime of death threats he was sued by the justice department for discrimination 1991 black guys counting my money i hate it the only kinds of people i want counting my money are short guys that wear yarmulkes every day i think that the black guy is lazy and it's probably not his fault because laziness is a trait in blacks it really is 1992 trump's casino was fined two hundred thousand dollars for transferring black dealers off certain tables to appease racist patrons 1993 trump said native american casinos shouldn't be allowed because they don't look like indians to me 2000, Trump ran a series of attack ads against Native American casinos alleging, with no proof, that they were guilty of crimes. 2004, Trump fired a black contestant from The Apprentice for being overeducated. 2010, Trump arguing in favor of segregating Muslims in Lower Manhattan. 2011, birtherism. Trump alleged that Obama was Kenyan based on nothing but skin color. He never apologized nor denounced the claim. Black Americans, we need to wake up fast. I mean, very, very fast. I just watched the uh, recent interview that Vice President Kamala Harris did with the National Association of Black Journalists. Now, in that interview, one of the journalists had asked her a direct question about reparations for blacks. And she jogged around and she ran around and she did not give a definitive answer as to what she would do for black people. Now, key note I want to point out, Remember, there was an interview that she did uh, not too long ago when she was asked about uh, reparations and what she would do for black people. And she said directly that she would not do anything uh, that would directly just impact black people. All the uh, 
other questions that she was at. Well, there was a couple other questions that she was asked. Uh, one uh, was about how to win over the black male vote. So there was two questions about black people. Uh, what would you do as it pertains to reparation? And the other one was how would you, uh, what would you do to go about winning the black male voters? Because the journalist said that black men are uh, leaning toward Donald Trump in this election, like me. So in the, her answer to, the, to both questions, the thing that she said is that her uh, her her uh, campaign policies, the things that she's proposing, that it includes blacks. Now that's really important, and the reason why I'm pointing this out is I did some research on uh, her uh, position on LGBTQ community and her position on women's rights. Now, when it let's uh, start with the women's rights. Now, when it comes to women's rights, she did, she never said that. I'm not going to do something that just benefit women. I'm going to do uh, any a law that I uh, pass. Uh, women will be included in it, but I'm not going to do nothing that just benefit women. Now let's look at Roe v. Uh, Roe, Roe versus Wade, and now she's a very strong advocate for that. That only benefit women. Now uh, why did she why why is she advocated for Roe versus Wade, but she does not advocate for anything that directly benefit black people and in particular um, directly benefit black men that's very very important now let's look at the uh, her issues on LGBTQ community now she passed uh, or she supported and passed multiple laws and bills as it relates to the gay community one in particular is gender affirming uh, care uh, health care for even those that are in that are in prison so she also passed the equity uh, or she was supported of uh, the equity act uh, that was for the lgbt community then she also made sure that the civil rights act of 1964 that it included lgbtq uh, people so these were direct direct uh, laws that affects only LGBTQ people that she made sure that she uh, participated, that she supported, that she passed, and some of them that she wrote and legis uh, legislated. Now, the reason why that's important is because if you want the black vote, you need to do something directly that will only benefit black people because gender affirming uh, care, that's going to only def uh, uh, benefit transgender people. So we want something that's going to only benefit us. Uh, abortions, that's going to only benefit women. So we want something that's going to benefit us only as well. Now, uh, when it comes to the issues of Israel. She support uh, certain bills and laws that only uh, help Israel. So we want something that will only benefit us as black people. So Kamala Harris, we're not voting for you. Uh, there, are, there. Let me just say it like this, because there are a lot of black people that are voting for you simply because you're black. But not all of us is going to fall for that trick. We, There's a percentage of us black Americans that will not vote for you based off of your skin color and uh, also that's not going to vote for you based off of your gender. Now I'm going to vote for the candidate no matter what uh, skin color they are, no matter what gender they are, that's going to benefit my family where my family will get the most mm -hmm. benefits from. Now the things that's important for my family is the nuclear family. That's my number one issue. I have no greater issue than that. The nuclear family is my greatest singular issue when it comes to uh, how I'm going to cast my vote. That's the reason why. Because when you destroy the nuclear family, you destroy the community. And that's what we see in America at this moment. Now, I'm currently in uh, Uganda in East Africa because I had to get far away from the Democrats and their policies because I see firsthand what it's doing to our uh, country, what it's doing to our people. So now, with me... The nuclear family, the importance of it. When we look into, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna uh, talk about the black community for a moment. When we look into the streets of the black community, we see that uh, 70 plus percent, about 72, 75 percent of black children are growing, growing up in single family households. We see a very high 
percentage of violence in our community. Our community is overwhelmed with violence, with drug addiction. Our community is overwhelmed with single parent households, with teen pregnancy, with uh, abuse to women and children, to, uh, with sexual abuse. We have a lot of, um, of, of different issues that's plaguing our communities. And those issues are coming from the breakdown of the nuclear family. When a family have a mother and a father, I'm talking about the biological parents. I'm not talking about all this new structure that people are trying to push. But when a family has the uh, biological mother and biological father in the household, then the community thrives. The community has a better chance of being a strong community. The children have a better chance of being uh, very productive adults. Statistics shows it. Statistics shows that Children that grows up in a house without a father, they're more likely to go to prison. They're more likely to drop out of school. They're more, uh, they have a much higher uh, rate of teen pregnancy. This is statistics. This, the numbers are out there. Anyone can research because the numbers are out there. How do we combat this? We combat this uh, by putting legislations and laws in place that benefits the nuclear family. The same way you guys promote the, uh, the LGBTQ agenda, uh, starting from preschool uh, and teaching our children uh, these LGBT uh, uh, ideologies, teach them the nuclear family ideology. Teach them that a family's supposed to have a mother and a father, and the family's supposed to stick together. A family's supposed to work through those tough times. Teach our sons and daughters, their, uh, teach them gender roles. We teach our boys, my sons know that they're responsible for financially taking care of their family. I take care of my wife and I take care of my kids financially. My wife, she take care of our households and she take care of our children. There are gender roles in our house. There's no confusion in our house. My sons understand that. Teach our children gender roles. I tell my sons all the time, the, my smaller boys, four and six years old, I tell them, they see me hugging on their mother, loving on their mother. I say, this is how you're gonna be with your wife. You make sure you pick a good wife. I tell them uh, the type of qualities to look for in a wife. I show them the type of qualities to be as a husband, as a father. I sit down at the dinner table with them every single day doing homework with them. Yes, me, the father, I sit down with them and make sure that their homework is done. Uh, my children, are uh, they have excelled tremendously in their classes at school. Um, my six-year-old, he's uh, supposed to be in uh, first grade at the moment. They have him in second grade. Uh, my uh, uh, four-year-old, um, he's supposed to be in preschool. They have him in kindergarten. My children, they excel. That's because they have a mother and a father at home. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that every child that comes from a broken home um, is going to go to prison, is going to be a teen parent. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is they have a greater likability. They have a greater uh, likability to become addicted to uh, uh, drugs and alcohol. So we don't want to increase their likability. We want to make the uh, the road as smooth as we can for our children, for our families. So only way I see Ford with doing that is by uh, voting for the party that uh, supports the nuclear family, voting for the party that does not support the confusion that America has brought on to our community, to our, to our society. The LGBTQ, uh, the that man uh, is a woman now, that woman is a man now, uh, that boy is a dog, that girl is a cat. I'm not going for that. I ain't teaching my family that. So until uh, the Democrats wake up, smell the coffee, and they come on the side of, of, of what's right, they support what's right, what's just, what's fair, I can't give them my vote. I can't support them. That is the uh, actual reality. So the Democrats, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, Tim Walls, they are destroying America. They have no plan for black America. They have no plan for white America. They have no plan for the United States of America. Nothing that's sustainable. These Democrats, and I'm sorry to say this, I'm not trying to be racist, but they hate black people. These are the same people who fought to keep slavery in. These are the same people who built the KKK. These are the same people who hated us from the beginning. The Republican Party is the party of the blacks. Blacks free, the Republican Party is the only party that the black people actually assisted in finding.
But all of that history has been torn away. People say, oh, there was this big switch. There was never a big switch. There was never a big switch. So the same Democrats who hated black people from the beginning are the same ones who hate us now. And they use our cause. How did Black Lives Matter turn into something about LGBTQ? When blacks really don't support that. We're conservative about that. We're really not about that. Not only that, we don't support abortion. We're about abortion. This is the black culture. We, not only that, we're not about feminism. No, we're not. Black women marry their husbands and respect their husbands. That's what we on. We're not on this, oh, I, mean, I do what I want. We don't no. do that. That's not our community. Kayla, this is something that hasn't happened in decades. It hasn't happened since 1996, Brianna, and you mentioned that this was unions were a critical component of President Biden's winning coalition back in 2020. And Democrats had hoped that once again, especially after the policies put forth by the Biden-Harris administration, that it would be... You better thank a union member for the five-day work week. You better thank a union member for sick leave. You better thank a union member for paid leave. Kamala Harris, you are as fake as press on nails, and I can see right through you. Let me help you out with something, because maybe somebody must not have told you. On TV and on every interview, giving the same tired answer. So let me just help you out. When you are asked a question, why don't you try answering the question? People are not stupid. We can tell when you're dancing around the issue instead of answering the question. When you're asked, are people better off now or during Donald Trump's presidency? When you're asked about the border or your policies on immigration, answer the question. We don't care about your middle class upbringing. We don't care that your mama had to save up to buy a house. We don't care about your summer job at McDonald's. We don't care about the lawns of the neighborhood that you lived in and how everybody took care of their lawn. That does not matter to me and it doesn't matter to anybody else. I want you to answer the question because if people, I, my mind is already made up too, Kamala, because I can see right through you and I know that you fake. But for somebody else whose mind is not made up, let me just help you out. Answer the question so that they can decide between you and your opponent. I don't know if you're just trying to paint him as the villain and try to skate by to be the, like you, the hero or the nice person. We don't care about that. Because being a hero and voting for the nice person is not what pays the bills. You understand what I'm saying? We can see through you. And all that fake black accent that you keep doing, girl, you need to stop. Because you know good and well that you ain't got no black accent. You know good and well that you was born in San, you from San Francisco and in Canada. Where you get that black accent from? Stop doing that trying to be relatable. This does not make you relatable. It makes you look fake. And those of us like me, we can see through that. We can see through that. We can see through every interview that you do that instead of being that set of answering the questions that are on the minds of the millions of American people who have the power to elect you to the highest office in the land, you're dancing around the issue and you want to talk about how you was born a middle class kid and how your mother had to save up to buy a house. I don't care, Kamala. So just just to recap, stop dancing around the issue. Answer the question. If you're going to do an interview, answer a question that you are asked at the interview. For some of the history we've never been taught, listen up. Hey everybody, Professor Moore here. So this semester I'm teaching a modern world history course and next week we start the topic of slavery. Now, whenever I introduce slavery to my students, I begin by discussing how the United States has done a really good job of erasing the reality and the brutality of slavery from our public landscape and our cultural memory. And I think it's ironic that the motto of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and the motto on every anniversary of 9-11 is never forget. But when it comes to topics like the genocide of indigenous people or slavery, the motto is not not never forget. It's not even forget. It's let's pretend like this never happened. So there's a lot of examples I could point to to illustrate this fact, but whenever I'm talking about slavery with my students, I always start with an example close to home. So when I was younger, I went to John Yates Middle School. And growing up, I never knew who the hell this guy was. They didn't talk about it in the school. There wasn't any kind of sign or anything anywhere. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I thought, 
let me do some research and find out who was John Yates. And I remembered that there was one of those historical markers on the side of the road somewhere. So I went driving and I finally found it. Now, when you read the historical marker, you learn that John Yates opened two free schools. And when he died in 1731, he left all of his property and his will to those schools to continue to raise funds. So when you read this marker, it sounds like John Yates was a great guy. He was a philanthropist. Yeah, he was pivotal and free public education. But I had a feeling that there was more to the story. So I decided to do a little bit more research. That research led me to an amazing book by historian Jennifer Ose titled Institutional Slavery, Slaveholding Churches, Schools, Colleges, and Businesses in Virginia 1680 to 1860. So after reading this book, I learned about who the real John Yates was. John Yates was an English slave owner and he opened two free schools for poor white children. And the way that he raised the money to open those schools was through enslaved labor. So when John Yates left all of his property and his will to those schools to continue to raise money, that property was enslaved human beings. So in John Yates' will, he specified that he was endowing the schools with his slaves, explaining that it is my will and my desire that my slaves be hired out and the hire of them may cover the yearly wages of a schoolmaster and teachers forever. So what did he mean by forever? So in his will, Yates specifies that with God's blessing, he hopes that his female slaves can provide the school with a standing stock. So the idea was that these enslaved females would continue to reproduce and create more slaves to create more profit over time. And that's exactly what happened. So the way that the school created profit off of these enslaved individuals was by hiring them out. And it's really important to note that this process of hiring out was one of the most cruel and brutal aspects of an already evil and inhumane system. So in her study, Jennifer Ost notes that Yeats condemns his slaves and their descendants to being hired out from year to year for the rest of their lives. And she points out that as these schools turn to hiring out their slaves in the endowment, the slaves typically faced more separation from loved ones and more instability than slaves owned by individual masters or mistresses. She also goes on to note that renters of Yeats free school slaves made little effort to keep the families of the school slaves together. So in other words, for poor white children to get free education, enslaved black individuals had to be hired out and their families had to be ripped apart. William Wells Brown escaped slavery in 1834, and in his memoir, he wrote about how this process of hiring out slaves was absolutely cruel and torturous punishment. He says, the system of letting out slaves is one of the worst evils of slavery. The man who hires a slave looks upon him in the same light as does the man who hires a horse for a limited period. He feels no interest in him, only to get the worth of his money. Now, if you've ever seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, that's exactly what happens to the main character, Solomon Northrup. He's hired out to a sadistic slave owner, Edwin Epps, and that individual rapes and tortures his slaves. So hiring out slaves was extremely profitable for the Yates Free Schools, and it was the only way that they were able to exist. In her research, Jennifer Ost found that in 1860, the school hiring out slaves raised them $4,000 and compare that to the $500 they got by renting out farmland. So clearly these schools could not exist without enslaved labor. And that's exactly what happened. They only fell apart after slavery was ended during the Civil War. So Jennifer Ost comes to some really important conclusions in her book. And I want to share some of them with you. She finds that Institutional slaveholding could create a wide circle of beneficiaries of slavery, including teachers, students, and hirers of slaves. All of these individuals benefited from the existence of slavery without necessarily owning many or any slaves themselves. She goes on to note that the entire community enjoyed the advantage of knowing that a large group of enslaved laborers 
was reliably available for hire each year. Local planners had a flexible source of labor they could count on when they needed it, with no long-term commitment required. Because of the Yates Free Schools made slave men, women, and children of every age available, slaves were available at prices that made temporary entrance into the master class possible for almost anyone. Slave hiring, therefore, allowed poorer whites to enter the social ranks of masters, at least temporarily, at a much lower cost than was necessary for purchasing a slave outright. A lot of times I hear this argument that slavery wasn't that big in the South, that there was only a very small percentage of white families that owned slaves. And while there's some truth to that, this book, Institutional Slavery, points out how, in the case of the Yates Free Schools, individuals that did not even own slaves benefited from the existence of slavery, and they had a stake in fighting for this system to continue to exist. So think back to the historical marker. What does it tell us about John Yates? It tells us that he opened up two free schools, and in his will, he left his property for those schools to continue to raise money and exist. Well, what, what should that historical marker say? John Yates was a slave owner who opened up two free schools for poor white children that were run on enslaved labor. And when he died, he left his property, which was enslaved black Americans, to the school and he condemned them to slavery forever, and it only ended when slavery was ended during the Civil War. So just by looking at this historical marker, I mean, I find this absolutely disgusting that they left off everything because they leave out all of the truth. They whitewash history. They completely erase the reality and the brutality of slavery, and that's what these historical markers are designed to do. So honestly, if you ask me, I, I would like to see John Yates Middle School change its name. I don't know about you, but I, uh, if I had children today, I wouldn't want them to be going to John Yates Middle School because John Yates does not represent anything that this country is supposed to stand for, any of its most beautiful ideals that we've never lived up to, the idea that all human beings are created equal, the idea that we should strive for justice and liberty for all. Hold up. Ukraine is not a part of NATO. So did Kamala just openly admit that she shared American intelligence with Ukraine to show them how to defend themselves? Oh, my word. Oh, my God. Trump just made the biggest announcement at his rally today. I'm going to play a clip for you. This is yes. crazy. Trump 2024. We're going to put a temporary cap on credit card interest rates. We're going to cap it at around 10%. We can't let them make 25 and 30. A cap on credit card interest. This is why they don't like him. Okay? You know there's a whole lot of bankers and credit card people who 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 don't want Trump simply because he's for the people who stands to benefit from a cap on credit card interest regular american people come on now that is that is that's if you needed a reason if, i don't think you should be on the fence now are you ready for this he wants to give you more money back on your taxes. This man is for the people. He would lift the cap on state and local deductions so you can write off more on your taxes. So he's going to stop credit card companies from taking money from you in high interest payments. You know, they give you... 0% or low interest rate for the first year, and then they jack it up to 34%, done. He's going to let you write off more. He's going to let you write off more yearly on your taxes for local and, t and state. This man is for the people. He's for the people. Anyone 
who is thinking about voting for Kamala, if you know them, you send them this and you say, Trump is for the people. He wants to put money in the pockets of Americans. Anyone who says that he is for the, the elites and the rich, they're lying to you. Okay? All this man does is talk about putting money back in the middle class. Because that's how you make America great again. You make America great again by putting money in the pockets of the people who spend money. Who shops? Who buys stuff? The middle class. And that's how he will save this country. He's going to make things affordable again. He's going to make it so regular people can afford houses. And he's going to make it so people are getting jobs again. Trump is the people's president. He's the rock. He's like, he's the rock of politics. Okay? Do you smell what Trump is cooking? Do you smell what Trump is cooking? If Kamala was going to change things, she would have done it while she was vice president. If Trump was going to fuck shit up, he would have done it while he was president. What more else is there to say? It's crazy to me my people are fight to keep nothing. They complain about not having shit and you will never have shit. A black man said that. I got to fight you to do right by you. You know how exhausting that is? You know how hard it is to explain common sense to a robot? He looked like a human, she looked like a human, but this a fucking robot. All these robots in my motherfucking comments, they never argue what the fuck I say. They never argue with anything that I say. Just name call and, and, and I don't care, I'm black. And I'm a, I hope to God at the end of the day, all you got is black. I pray to God Kamala Harris win so all you got is fucking black like you been having. The same shit you been motherfucking having. Don't forget Trump has only been in office for four fucking years. And you about to blame the whole motherfucking world on him. But not the people in office. Not the people currently in fucking office. You black. I hope you wake up black and that's all the fuck you have for the rest of your fucking life. It's black. It's crazy. I got to fight against you to do right by you. I got to fight you to do right by you. That's exhausting as fuck. I wonder what's going on in his head right now. I wonder what he's thinking as his podcast host, Andrew Schultz, is just dogging on James and Fuhad for their apology to black women. Because he's a black man, too. So he should be just as culpable as James and Fuhad for just sitting there and not protecting black women against Andrew's jokes. I wonder how he's feeling right now. Because while Andrew Schultz is making fun of those boys for looking all sad and uncomfortable in their apology video, he's sitting there doing the exact same thing on the podcast. But look at look at how sad he is over on the left. Do so, you see how sad he is? We should go back. We should go back because he's going through it right now. Look look how he practiced this. Let me I'm gonna pick my skin I love off you finger. guys. <laughs> <laughs> So I need you to watch him. Look, he bite his bottom lip again. And it's about being human. It's about realizing that you don't know what you're prepared for. Their fight and flight instinct really kicked in after the power down. But with that joke about the black women, nothing, nothing really seemed... The fight or flight wasn't really there your delivery, afterwards. Your delivery was too good. Then. Maybe it, what they were seduced by the delivery. The only person that really did anything wild or kind of wrong in this situation was Andrew Schultz. And I think he knows that. I mean, yeah, they're just jokes at the end of the day, and people should be allowed to make and laugh at jokes. But I can't even lie and act like the optics of the person who made the joke and how excited he was to make that joke wasn't a little odd. I don't know. He might be feeling that same pressure that black women were putting on James and Fuhad, but he's just happy that he flew under the radar. Quick question. Who's going to tell these people that black men like black women? <laughs> I've been seeing it a lot lately. Where like that's a like response to a black woman's like try to like get a jab at him like oh that's why your man don't like you, that's why or I just seen a video of James and Fuha talking about like oh well if he was black then he wouldn't be getting black men da 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 da. 
am I am I missing something? Because my day to day, my life, what I see, black men love them some black women. Okay. Now, is there some black men who only date outside of their race? Yes. But nine times out of 10, people who think like that aren't always there, no matter how much money they have. And you usually just like steer away from them because like, I'm not about to sit here and be the first black girl you read into the world too, one. And two, you not, I'm not going to be the exception. And I hated that a compliment when people would try to like, oh, well, I don't date black girls, but I date you. Yeah, but going back to it, like, that's not a thing no more. They love black women. I know but the amount of black men that I know personally who only indulge in cocoa butter, baby. I just, in all shades, in all shades, not just, yeah, they, they love black women. So I don't, I don't know what y'all be talking about. I feel like that's a rhetoric that y'all got in the past. It was probably truthful back in the 2010s. Probably early tw- tw- 20s, 2020s, but it's not like that no more. It, it's worn out. It don't, it don't exist. It's, it's not valid no more. Listen, lady, I don't want to call you out your name, so I'm going to keep it short. But that weird shit, black men don't like black women, all that other bullshit, don't do that shit under my post, all right? I don't do that weird shit over here. Keep that weird shit where you at. Are we going to pull you over? Or are we just, are we just fucking with you? Could you do your best to not fuck with black people, though? For real? I'm not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be demeaning or, like, you know, a catch. Just, I, I really need you to understand that, like, that is really, really, really triggering. Like, My name is Robert Callahan. I'm an attorney. I'm an author. I'm also a former prosecutor that worked in the district attorney's office for four years. So when I tell you that I have worked with law enforcement, I need you to understand that this is a message that is meant to be instructive and, and hopefully a learning opportunity. The first time that I had a weapon pulled on me was by a law enforcement officer. Not because I did anything wrong, but because I fit the description. I had a friend in college who got pulled over so much that no one would ride with him. So it was kind of like this running joke. He was going to get pulled over and he was going to make them late to their destination because he was black in this town. He never got a ticket, never got arrested. I'm bothered that as a police officer, you didn't know what you should know. You should know that you shouldn't be in a uniform saying the kinds of things that you were saying, representing your department. That, that says that there is a support network in your organization that didn't see there being a problem. The fact that you don't understand the climate that we live in, that tells me that you are not surrounded by people that look like me who could advise you that the things that you're doing are not wise. That tells me that no one in your chain of command above you looks like me because they would surely have advised you that that would be ill-advised to do. I have a problem with the fact that your worldview and the authority that you wield do not consider people like myself. And so I have a problem with you doing anything on this app without some long introspection. Like maybe you need to unplug, you need to go read some books, you need to go listen to some podcasts. You need to get some training and some understanding and everyone in your department needs it. Well, they're saying it out loud. Uh, residents would like to bring back, you know, hangings in the town square because they are losing their white majority. And they said that'll set them straight. Put up the picture full mass. California. Mayor Lamar Thorpe is actually furious at some community members who are defending racism in the town. Authorities in the San Francisco Bay Area have now opened an investigation after a social media post called for bringing back, quote, hangings in town square to fix Antioch right up, end quote. Coming just one year after city police officers faced intense scrutiny for participating in online chat rooms where racist and homophobic comments were exchanged on a regular basis. So interim Antioch police chief Brian Addington announced this week that investigations are looking into the recent social media comments as potential criminal or terroristic threats, but would not elaborate, quote, it's an open investigation. So we're not going to comment further on it. 
Addington said, according to San Jose Mercury News. Quote, it should be wrapped up within a couple of weeks at most. The latest probe comes amid persistent racial tensions in the greater community while Antioch's police force continues to confront issues of bigotry and extremism within its ranks. Now, let's be very clear. A lot of this will actually be covered by freedom of speech. However, while the police chief says we're investigating people, citizens, and maybe police officers, this has been an ongoing issue. This is not new. They had a big blow up because of exposure just last year. Many of those cops are still on the force. So you have a cultural issue inside of the police department, which, by the way, only operates by the permissive will or the mandated will of the government and or the people. But a police officer does not have the same, let's just say, rights to be a cop as they have to be a citizen. If you do things or say things that are egregious, bigoted, racist, sexist, homophobic, you can be fired on the spot as a cop. Your freedom of speech is intact. That doesn't mean you have the right to be a police officer because it is, in fact, a position of public trust. My point is, if the chief wanted to do something about it, the chief could do something about it now. With millions watching and many people benefiting from this program called Indisputable, we just need 1% of the viewers to become a paid member so we can continue to bring this content to you. Now back to the show. There's more. Addington stated that once the investigation is complete, the case will then be referred to the county DA for review to determine whether charges will be filed against any of the individuals found to have violated the law. The post allegedly from a man claiming to reside in nearby Oakley was first brought to the city's attention during the August 27th city council meeting. Resident Nicole Arrington raised the issue, addressing the council and later providing screenshots of the post to officials, including Addington, the police chief. She stated that the remarks were part of a broader pattern of vile, racist, and hateful comments directed at Black members of the council and city staff. Quote, us calling out the truth doesn't make us racist. We are not running around saying we hate people or somebody should be hung. We are not going to start talking about hanging, Arrington said. We are people of love. We don't run around hating, hurting, or talking about hurting people. But if you keep talking about hurting people and making terroristic threats, then it might be a problem. She continued, the latest incident follows the vandalism of one um, of one of Mayor uh, Lamar Thorpe's campaign signs, where someone defaced the image by adding a clown wig and nose to his face and removing Hernandez from the name. There's more. Earlier this year, the mayor legally added Hernandez to his surname following a successful petition to the county court as a tribute to the Mexican immigrants who actually raised him. Racial tensions in Antioch, a city of 115,000, have simmered for years, fueled by the doubling of black population over the past two decades, while the white demographic has dwindled to just more than one-third of the city's residents. In 2020, Antioch voters made history by electing three black members of the five-person city council. Now, that's what did it. Once mm -hmm. the election turned into an exacting approximation of the population, once that happened, that's when all hell broke loose. However, this milestone was overshadowed when the city's police force, they became embroiled in a scandal involving racist text messages where officers used derogatory slurs against people of color, including against their own chief of police at that time, Stephen Ford. Out of the department's 88 cops, about half were found to have received racist, homophobic, and sexist messages following the investigation. 17 of the cops were placed on leave, some resigned, others remained on the force, but not in public-facing roles. Zero were fired. Among them, three officers, excuse me, faced charges as part of an alleged conspiracy to assault Black residents for sport. They are scheduled for trial this year. 
Council member Tanisha Torres Walker described the hanging comment as, quote, outrageous, underscoring. It is a stark reminder of the deep-seated hostility lying beneath the surface of the community. Days before a recent council meeting, Therese Walker drew attention to a troubling find she made on social media. Okay, now remember, these are citizens doing better investigation than the cops, all right? So there's this finding on social media, a highway sign near Concord boldly declaring, quote, not white, not welcome. Not white, not welcome. I've always said I'm not as worried about those who are loud and vocal. Their bigotry is clear. I'm more concerned about the people who aren't saying anything or listening to all these things, she said, according to the newspaper. It's a bold thing to say publicly, but I'm glad people are saying it publicly because you know where they are. A recent council meeting was fraught with racial tensions as the council voted to appoint a black woman, Bessie M. Scott, as Antioch's new city manager. The move sparked an uproar among some residents who zeroed in on Scott's social media history when they claimed, which they claimed included discussions of systemic racism and social constructs that favor one race over another. And the council chambers, tensions, tensions flared much like they did last year when the racist text messages from police officers first came to light understand the attempt at equivocation. You have the same level of energy coming from many of the residents because the city voted to hire someone who posted about structural racism, who posted about possibly systemic racism, trying to find remedies, trying to find solutions. You may not agree with all of them, but at least she's making an attempt to combat the actual racism that exists. But they find that to be just as racist as the racist public servants who get paid taxpayer money in order to protect and serve being engaged in actual racism inside of their city. There's more. At one point during the meeting, uh, excuse me, uh, during that uproar, uh, Mayor Fernandez Thorpe found himself the target of a disturbing threat within the text. An officer had suggested he would offer a prime rib dinner to anyone who shot the mayor with a sponge bullet. Referring to the non-lethal rounds officers sometimes use during raids. At the time, Atlanta Black Star reported that Thorpe called for a special meeting to discuss the, next, the text messages, but the talks ended abruptly with yelling and finger pointing What's the irony here? I'll give an example. When I was a kid, when I was young, I worked at Chick-fil-A. Okay? It's an honorable job. It's a hard job. It's a difficult job. But it's an honest job. They had standards there. Okay? If I would have said that about my superior, I would have been fired. Why? Because they had protocol. They had rules. We had expectation to be professional. However, if you happen to be a cop with access to weapons and your job is to, in fact, protect and serve, you can say you are willing to give somebody a dinner to shoot your boss with a projectile and nothing happens to you, but other folk advocate and argue on your behalf. At one point during the meeting, Fernandez Thorpe snapped at one of his constituents saying, he was disgusted by the racial disharmony that remained pervasive throughout the city. Quote, I am sick and tired of being attacked by these people in this community. Apologizing for the racism going on in this community. Fernandez Thorpe steamed, adding, you're the problem. You're the problem. At one point, the mayor seemed to challenge the man to step outside for a fist fight, saying, you want to go outside? Let's go. Last year, the texting investigation became part of a broader probe by the FBI and the DA, which had been examining corruption across various Bay Area police departments since 2019. Since 2019, the latest council meeting mirrored the texting conflict erupting into 
a heated exchange as emotions boiled over once again at the August 27th meeting as the debate over Scott's hiring grew increasingly heated, Antioch resident Erica Ralston, who is black, experienced a chilling moment that left her hair standing on end. From behind her, she said a woman's voice cut through the den with a searing accusation. Quote, you guys are the problem. You guys are racist, the stranger's voice nagged. I turned around and said, no, Ralston recounted. When I turned back, I heard her call me a racist B word. From there, Ralston said the woman had the audacity to ask if she wanted to take the matters outside. Ralston recounted that she didn't follow the woman out the door, heeding her mother, Leslie May, who had snatched her arm and cautioned that she could go to jail. This is that powder keg dynamic about to explode if something does not dramatically change. The mayor obviously all the way to capacity here. The people of the community all the way fed up. The whites in the community, the ones that are bigoted, feel as if something has been taken away from them because they no longer have whites in the majority of executive leadership. When that happened, when that vote took place, all of a sudden things changed. But I thought this was a democracy. Mm -hmm. I thought they respected constitution, rule of law, law and order, right? Not when they feel threatened, not when they feel as if their power to do as they please and get away with it evaporates. Um, this is a hell of a thing from the police to the citizens to the perpetrators. It seems as if there, there's this cultural dynamic where they simply don't want to let go of the bigotry and racism inside of their ranks. Yeah, this is a fascinating story. And Antioch, just as a city to study, I encourage everyone to uh, watch United Shades of America mm. with Kamau Bell. He did a great interview uh, with some of the uh, leaders there. Um, but you're right, it has changed. And now it, there, the white population in Antioch, which is openly racist, um, is trying to, again, like you're saying, fight the actual representation of the black population by their electing, electing council people and whatnot. The other thing interesting to know is that the majority of people in Antioch are Latino, right? But but potentially they don't have the same amount of representation, um, you know, for various reasons. Uh, maybe they are un undocumented. Maybe they're unable to vote. Um, maybe they just don't have political representation. But that seemed all fine and hunky dory with the white population. It wasn't until the black population, you know, uh, increased, and they were like, "No, we're going to elect, you know, black city council members," considering that our police are sharing racist text messages, and we have threats from you know, people on Facebook saying there should be hangings. So that is all that is all on one side. I do I want to point out that the reason the black population in Antioch has increased is because the white liberals and the people with money in the San Francisco Bay Area have booted out and gentrified all yep. of the areas that used to be predominantly black, Bayview, Oakland, all around the Bay, right? Places that, you know, were predominantly black. When it became unaffordable, what happens? Black Americans are moving out. They're moving to places that are more affordable for them. And then, of course, they're in a place where, once again, not welcome because you have the liberal, <laughs> the li white liberals who are low key racist, uh, <laughs> you know, gentrifying black Americans out into the very openly racist Antioch. And by the way, Concord, I believe, don't quote me on this, but has a high population of neo-Nazi groups, which is wild considering this is the liberal Bay Area, but don't forget, like you go outside of the cities and yeah. there's some crazy white people out there, some racist white people. So this is fascinating. I'm glad that there is, again, this push to actually hold people accountable. This shows that there's some hope, right? And it shows that the cops and um, people in charge better watch themselves uh, because, you know, residents aren't gonna take this lying down. Yeah, uh, big ups to the residents who are being active and vocal. At least there's two concurrent investigations. We're going to follow this until there's remedy. Last night, Kamala Harris cooked Donald Trump in the debate. She had a plan. She laid out the details of her plan on how she going to fix the economy. Or did she? I'm looking at the comments. People like, she ate, she ate. Did she eat exactly? What is Kamala Harris? is playing for the economy that you heard last night. Because a lot of y'all are like, she laid out a plan. No, 
She said she had a plan and she kept reiterating that she had a plan, but she never once told you what the plan was. You know why? Because she knows the plan doesn't matter. She knows that you're not voting for her because of her plan. You're voting for her because of what's between her legs. Mm -hmm. Sounds like how men would pick women because of what they look like. And we were like, oh, these men are not very smart because they're not picking women for good qualities. They're only picking them because of what she looks like. That's what y'all trying to do for a president. Because Kamala Harris has a plan that's so amazing that she never once shares a detail of it. I give Trump credit for him saying, I don't have a plan, I have concepts, I'm not the president. We'll formulate the plan once we get in office with the team. Kamala's like, I have a plan. She has a cool name, the Opportunity Economy. She never once detailed what the opportunities in the economy would be. Kamala Harris's plan to fix the economy is $6,000 for the first year of a child's life via tax credit. Have a baby, get you $6,000. What's the plan? I would love to hear it. Please tell me what Kamala Harris's plan is to fix the economy based on the debate you watched. Now I'm convinced that Kamala Harris's campaign is sending a group of people to directly report my videos. This video here showed an emphasis on the two different black voters that we have here in America. This is the old, original, democratic black voter who is stuck in their ways and doesn't want to change their mind. This is the new black voter who is aware of everything that's going on in this country. Every time that I post a single video about anything that goes against Kamala Harris, they're blocking and shadow banning my videos and they're reporting it as a community guidelines violation. Now this same video, they got almost 200,000 views in the first 12 hours. I'm having to go through this. Now, this video didn't violate community guidelines in any type of way. Now I'm sitting here having to appeal this. And every time I post a video that shows Trump in a positive light with black voters, it's somehow shadow banned. And I've made several videos to expose things about Kamala Harris and somehow somebody at TikTok is still working with the Democrats. I think. The Democrats, the Democrats have scared TikTok straight into removing any videos that talks about them in a negative light. And so before I got on here to say what I'm about to say, I made sure that I read everything up before I say what I got to say. She's not a victim. She chose to have intercourse. She chose to get pregnant. And then she did not want the twins. And then she went to a doctor, took some pills, and then her life got taken because of the side effects of that said pill. That's not a victim. You can't blame the abortion ban for her death. She chose to take pills that had side effects that killed her. That's her fault. The fact that women can walk around, have the intercourse, get pregnant, and then play the victim is mind blowing to me, which is why I don't believe in abortion. The fact that your family is sitting up here supporting your negative behavior, which caused your life to be taken, is why you ended up in that situation. Lack of self accountability and it's all black women. <coughs> No, Tatiana does not feel bad. It's sad that her life was taken, but she allowed her life to be taken because she chose to not be accountable for her actions. Baby, once you get pregnant, why are you gonna risk your life on getting an abortion? Don't have intercourse, it's that simple. It is that simple. It's not like there was anything wrong with her body for her not to carry those twins, okay. So I want y'all to watch this video before I gotta say what I gotta say. This is what it looks like when a parent walks up to the outside of a baby box, uh, opens the door, places the newborn inside the medical bassinet, takes the orange bag, shuts the door, and walks away. Now, as a mother of a son, I find it weird that as women, we can have abortions. We can throw a baby in a, in a baby canister at a fire station and nothing is ever said. But when a man wants to walk away and not deal with the child, not deal with the woman, it's an issue. I generally feel like that because I'm a mother of a boy who's going to become a man. I generally find it funny how y'all want to hold men up to this high standard where they have to do everything the correct way. But y'all allow women to play victim. Women can legit try to go to a birth clinic. A, a abortion clinic kill twins and then she die and her family can get on TV and play a victim I find that weird I find it weird how as a woman I have power to play a victim in a situation that I cause for myself and my body I find it weird how I can hold a man accountable but I'm not responsible for holding myself accountable in these type of situations I find it weird I find it weird how it's all black women supporting Kamala Harris but y'all are the same women complaining about your state and your your conditions and your lifestyle when y'all are the reason why you have to go through those things that y'all go through baby being a victim as 
a black woman is the mental condition. Family, I would say forgive me to the extent of this is some absolute fuckery. All right, so I, I really don't want to be cussing like that. However, this this goddamn tether pissed me off at the highest levels of passivity. All right, I'm actually going to do another video and break down the nonsense he was talking about. And then I got a coon behind him. And then I got another Negro attacking our brother Tariq. Oh, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess and all these guns get broken down and shut up today. Some Ebo news for your ass. So Harriet Tubman is a part of Ebo American history. This is why. Harriet Tubman was born in Maryland, Dorchester County. Look up Maryland and Ebos. After you do that, you'll realize Harriet Tubman was an Ebo slave descendant. With no American rights, so she wasn't American, so what was she? She was Ebo. You're welcome. Harriet Tubman history, Ebo Quenu, Ebo Quezzi. You're welcome. I love little AI summaries. Oh my goodness. Don't worry, I'm gonna give you guys a screenshot, but look at this. Harriet Tubman is not directly part of Ebo culture. As she was born and lived in the United States, but a story of resistance against oppression and her role in leading enslaved people to freedom through the Underground Railroad resonates deeply, resonates with the Igbo people of Nigeria who also have a strong history of fighting against slavery. I don't know about that one. And, value, and valuing communal liberation, making her a symbolic, symbolic figure of inspiration within the culture, within their cultural narrative, particularly due to the shared theme of escaping bondage and seeking freedom. Yeah, they were escaping the bondage, all right, and seeking freedom by fleeing, which aligns with Igbo traditions and stories. I'm FBA, nigga. I'm FBA. They want to crowbar their way into our culture. Now that we've done the legwork, the hard work, oh, remember, these are the same people. Y'all not going to get reparations. You're 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 not going to get reparations. Why do you need reparations? What is what about black on black crime? There's no racism. In the next video, I got one of the boy. You can tell by the hairline, he's tether. This is why we delineate. Because if we did not delineate, somebody would have said this five years ago, six, seven years ago. Somebody would have said this, and we'd be like, "Man, oh!" And we would have bought into the bullshit. But no. I love that we delineated so we can call this mess out and I have no real pushback from those silly people because this Negro doubles down. Watch this. And if y'all think I care about y'all hating on me proving that Harriet Tubman is Ebo, you- You didn't prove that. A quick Google search disproves that immediately. You could kiss my Ebo ass. Nah, we might want to K-I-C-K it, but nah, we ain't kiss nothing. You came here. Fleeing ass tether. Kiss my ass. You don't want to know your history. Y'all don't want to. That's. We don't have a history of fleeing. Ethnogenesis. Shout out to our brother Tariq, man. Y'all, y'all, y'all. Show some love. Go get some root work. Shout out to that brother. I got root work. I got to buy some more. And the USPS office lost my package. I bought all six. So I'm, I, I got one of them. So I got to buy five more because I refuse to be musty like this musty tether speak african language y'all find out that y'all were slaves and y'all let that be the beginning no we found out that we were enslaved we found out that we fought during slavery we found out that we had so many rebellions we found out that we are also part of the indigenous group that was here we all mixed in together we had the great dismal swamp we was whooping ass all across this country we was whooping ass all across this country that's what we find out and then we find out we had fleeing tethers like you coming in the mix gumming up the works, causing dissension and doubt in us. And we was like, nah, after t after time, after we got the kumbaya, let's, uh, let us pray group. I'm sorry to the olders. I'm not sorry to the olders. I'm sorry to the elders. The olders, y'all were holding us back. We, well, we don't want to, don't say that. Especially, I can't stand it. Don't say that person. No, it needs to be said. So these, these niggas won't be sitting here. <laughs> 
Let me finish this, man. Of your entire people, when in order for y'all to have gotten here, you had to have been enslaved. So if you don't want to hear none of y'all- Wrong. A lot of us was here already, bruh. We've been here. We've been here. We was doing better without y'all. Because we didn't have nobody like y'all coming and works, want to be comfortable around white supremacy and around white folk beating you up. We would have been further ahead. Heritage, your history, don't, don't. Not our heritage. They not like us. Be on here. Because I'm talking Igbo shit, baby. I'm not talking about nothing. Why aren't you talking Igbo shit back in your homeland, bro? And you talking about we don't speak, want to speak the language. Bro, you don't even speak your language. None of that other stuff. If you think she all this other shit and you from there, bro, talk about your people. But I'm talking about the Igbos, bro. Yeah, they want to win so bad. They don't have a Harriet Tubman. Google just proved that in a summary to AI. I was like, hold on, man. Let me just dunk this bullshit. Shout out to AI. The AI was like, nah, hey, look. And you notice, if you notice that screenshot, the way it frames it, Ebo and African Americans, which we're gonna we're gonna get it to we work in family, we're gonna get to say black Americans. It's even showing that it's understanding where hey, we're delineating. Even the AI is understanding that we're delineated for family, we are getting these wins. These little wins are gonna equal the big wins. It's gonna to equal to us getting reparations, equal to us getting us an anti-black hate crime bill. It's gonna be equal to us finally getting the equal footing that we deserve, that we we need and deserve. So we gotta stay on track, family. Stay on track. This is Ebo page, so there ain't gonna be no Ebo slander. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that. My mom has eight brothers and sisters. Every last black person that I know in my life, which is quite a few, every last one of them has a government ID. It would be insulting to talk to my family and say to them, you know what, sorry, y'all, you know, we're, you're black and it's just, you know, so hard for you to get an ID like all the white people. That's absurd. And we as a country have got to reject this farce. I speak so strongly against this because I view myself as an American first. I am a veteran. I am a husband. I am a congressman. I'm someone that served this country. I'm an educated black man. And somewhere down the line, I am black and I am proud. And I understand that. But what I never want to do is marginalize a single group in this country by saying that you weren't good enough to get an ID. Because my 18-month-old has an ID. Family, let me know in the comments if you want me to do a full breakdown on Mr. Hunt. Because a lot of what he said was very problematic. And I'm pretty sure I have an idea of whom we might be married to or what skin tone they might have. And other things. Let me know if y'all want me to do a full breakdown of that, that clip in that segment and kind of go through what he said and how it's very, very actually anti-black. I have a message for this man, Tariq Nasheed. For those of you who aren't familiar with him, he's an American TV and film producer, and he's also an ally of Donald Trump. He already started to lie. He started out good. Got the name right. Got his accolades, his, his titles, the things that he's achieved, right? He's an ally of Donald Trump. No brother, our brother has been an ally of tangibles. It's policy over party. Now, he has, along with other people like myself, have been going in on the Dems very hard because we've been supporting the Dems for the longest time. We have not supported the Republicans en masse for 60 some odd years. If we were Republican supporters getting the same treatment, we'd be on their bumper. All right? So, that, why are we lying? He claims to be the leader of a movement. And you hella lying. Our brother has vehemently said, I'm not a leader of no one. And you can't be a leader of a lineage. All right? You are trying to frame this narrative. See, this is the type of Negro that'll get a black man unalived. Remember, Remember that white LGBT dude, that anti-black white LGBT dude trying to get our brother unalived by swatting his house, trying to get him gunned down from his wife and children? Remember that. That was some years back. That happened. 
Remember that. Right there on the Uncensored the Truth Podcast. Yes. Right here with your brother Sam and Oh God. I see Oh God got another story brewing up. This is a fucked up one, man, right here. Why don't you talk about it, bro? Oh, man. Man, we got to give shout out, you know, uh, to Tariq Nasheed, you know, doing a lot of, you know, um, he had the um the documentary that he put out. Um, the fuck's name of the shit? Hidden Colors. Yeah, Hidden Colors. Tariq Nasheed put the Hidden Colors documentary out great documentary you know what i mean so um salute for him and his production you know work well uh apparently you know i'm looking right here you know um the police and swat team were called to Tariq nasheed uh his residence out there in um i think la los angeles yeah so let me pull this up real quick and um because i'm gonna actually show y'all the video right here and this is at Tariq nasheed's residence we're gonna get right to this one Fox Los Angeles police officers creep toward the home of Tariq Nasheed. He was sound asleep when police first tried to make contact by telephone. They said, this is the police. You need to come outside. What are you wearing? So I hung up again. I'm like, that sounds weird. A fourth call sent Nasheed to his front door. I looked out the front door and there's people with guns pointed at me. He called the police back and was advised to go outside with his ID. They were told that there was bombs in the house and bomb. I had my wife kidnapped and tied up and it was just a whole thing they made up. And again, the police kind of suspected that it could have been a swatting thing. Swatting is when someone makes a false report to police, prompting an emergency response. A lot of stuff we want to talk about tonight. Nasheed is a popular figure on YouTube and has produced a series of documentaries about blacks in America. Anytime you talk about racial injustice, that's going to make you a target. Going back and Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Dr. King. He believes white supremacists are behind the swatting, the same ones that troll him online and have sent police on false reports to his public speaking events. This, though, is the first time he's been targeted at home and involved his wife and child. Nasheed remained cool but questions why he was handcuffed when police already suspected this was a bogus call. They were actually good guys and I take my hat off to them. They were very professional. But what if they weren't though? You know, that's a dangerous situation to put somebody in, especially a person, a black American in this day and age where you can be killed with impunity. A shout out to Sam Ant and Oh God, go check out their channel. But yeah, they they try to get our brother alive. But let's let's get back to this this coon. FBA, Foundational Black Americans, which seeks to promote the interest of African Americans. That's doublespeak. FBA, Foundational Black Americans, which seeks to promote the interest of African Americans. No, that's why we have FBA, Freedmen, because we're delineating. We have delineated. We're not African Americans. We don't, we have, we've had an ethnogenesis. That's a doublespeak. We got to watch people like him. And that nasally voice. It's not like he's been picked on. In reality, he's nothing more than a two-bit hustler who is allowing his skin color to be used by racists like Donald Trump and J.D. Vance to launder racist, anti-Haitian immigrant sentiment. When has Tariq ever had a meeting with Trump? Now, he's opened the doors for Trump and Harris to sit down and have a talk with the black community. Like, hey, I do it. We know he's going gonna to be on live. We know this brother will not let himself have a conversation with them without it being on live. So what are you talking about? I think he might be hazing himself. What y'all think, fam? Shame on you, Tariq Nasheed. And I have a question for you. How cheaply were they able to buy you? What did it take? An invite? A dinner? A couple of clicks on a tweet? Was that enough to get you to allow your platforms to be used to promote hatred and threats of violence against your fellow brothers and sisters of African descent? Threats of hatred and acts of violence, what? I, I, there's only a, a few, over the course of years, Twitter spaces, or I should say X spaces, I've not been able to be in. And even so, he uploads his spaces to a channel. He does it in a clip form now where he does like so much of a space. If it's if it's short enough or if it's, if it's super long, he'll he'll put it in segments. I have never heard this brother say, hey, go jump on some Haitians. Put hands on Haitians. It's funny how when black Americans, foundational black Americans call out the actions of other groups and we don't put the cape on anymore, all of a sudden we're promoting violence against them. Because we're like, hey man, I love when he when he first said, "Hold your own nuts." Yeah, that's that makes sense. 
Because, see, our brother, he's a thought leader, right? He's a thought leader. He's a thought provoker. Yeah. See, brothers like him, Jason Black, Professor Black Truth, Great Black Shark, Alpha Elite, Black Alpha Network, ZZ Rance, all these brothers and sisters, our sister, I can't forget, Vicky Dillard. Um, they are saying what we want to say out loud. And they're like, it's, we're, it's making it okay to say it. Like, oh, yeah, you know what? Hold your own nuts. We got our own issues. And when we help you with your issues, we ask and we look for you to help with our issues. I kind of, ah, that's a black person problem. I'm Haitian. That's a black person problem. I'm Jamaican. That's a black person problem. I'm Nigerian, Igbo, Hufa Falani, all these, you know. All right. So now we're saying, hey, hold your own nuts. It's unfortunate what's happening to you. Very unfortunate. That's your problem. The fact that you would seek to promote anti-Haitian American sentiment on the part of black people is shameful. He's not promoting anti-Haitian sentiment. We, as a group, are promoting our self-interest. We are interested in FBA interest first, second, third, fourth, and last. It is unfortunate what's happening to the Haitians. Very unfortunate. Hold your own nuts. All right? We all came over here on the same boat. There were just different stops along the way. So like I can tell you, tell the brother, a lot of us was here already. The little mouthy broad, it was like, didn't y'all, y'all talking about, come on, I ain't black. But didn't y'all say y'all grandmother Indian? Yes. Indigenous. Yes. She was black skinned. Yes. We've been here. We mixed in with some of the Africans, but we've been here. You're nothing more than a very slick, two-bit modern-day overseer on the plantation who is doing the bidding of racists like J.D. Vance and Donald Trump. And this is another message for Dr. Cornell West. You have 48 days to continue the grift and to take whatever money is being given to you to act like this type of man here, Tariq Nasheed. Or you can salvage what's left of your legacy and stand up for the things you claim to care about, truth, justice, and love. Dr. West, we already know where a hustler like Tariq Nasheed is going. The real question, what will your legacy be? Do I, how do you, that pivot was a hard pivot. So, black family, let me get this straight. Because Tariq doesn't put on the cape. And we got people, you know, they like to count his pockets and make money. And my issue is, with that is, other groups make money off us. We make money with us. And we got a problem. Oh, why are he getting all that money? Why aren't you doing something to get money? This brother has used his platform to promote other businesses. And yes, there's a fee. Yes. See, a lot of y'all have this this thought process that black empowerment is this multi-million dollar thing. You know, no, 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 no. I didn't start getting the traction until I started doing these compilations and, and bringing the family together, showing that, hey, outside of YouTube and other platforms and things of that nature, like TikTok, and some of you don't want to go to TikTok. You don't want to get to that. Okay, I'll bring it to you. Some of you don't want to go on space. Okay, I'll bring it to you. I didn't get a lot of traction. I've been doing black empowerment for the longest time. You go down my, go down my, go down my, I got to hit you with the Umar three times. Go down my YouTube page, you will see black owned business after black owned business after black owned product after black owned product. Giving honest reviews. And eventually I got to the point where I just really stopped caring about it because it just, I, it wouldn't get any traction. It never gained the traction. Even like when I first started, I was super excited and I was like, bam, let me, I want to do this. Couple hundred views at most. My biggest videos were when Figures was back out and he had that debacle where the phone was supposed to be this thing and Jeezy was behind it and it's 30,000 views. But that was years ago. I've upgraded my equipment. I went from uh, all in one computer trying to edit on that to a Mac Studio so I can make sure I can edit and get you guys 4K. I've done it, but the push and the reach that it's had has been 
minimum. Black empowerment is not a moneymaker. It is not. It's just not. So you have to find other means and things to do. Okay, let me sell deodorant. But now I'm not going to sell you any deodorant. I'm going to sell you quality deodorant. I use a lot of deodorant. Root work is actually the best. Bevel used to be up there, but Bevel, they had to get a parent company. Well, a parent company comes in, they got a certain amount of control. So they're going to make changes to make sure they can be viable and make money and keep the product out. That's just how it goes. I don't know why we have this disconnect that, okay, if you're a black empowerment, you're supposed to be poor and broke. This we poor, we broke, we all going to heaven mentality. They got to die. Okay? Yes, he's doing well. His books did well. And he's up. No different than like a Bun B. Bun B, he did what he, he did in the beginning. Flipped it over, got in the rap, blew up. Okay, now he's doing burgers. You can go around and look. A lot of cats that, that was hustlers, that street hustlers, are doing well. T.I. He ain't got no college education. Dude dropped out of high school. And living better than a lot of us. Because of hustle mentality. Hey, let me offer a product and service or something that you need. And get it at the highest quality that I can get it to you for a reasonable price. Boom. And then branch out to other things. Family, we can do the same thing. All right? Quit counting people's pockets. If you can watch this man make money and you you got time to sit and watch a man make money, you got time to get up off your ass and go make money for yourself. And that's all I got to say, family. Peace and black empowerment. And if you want this shirt, let me know and I'll get it up on my YouTube store.